Welcome back. In the last few videos, we've looked at the constituent parts of logic, the semantics, the syntax, and the deductive system. And we've also taken a look at two key properties that we would like logics to have. Soundness, which is the really important one, and completeness, which is desirable, but not always possible. And in this video, I'd like to give you a couple of examples. So we're going to look firstly at an example from propositional logic, continuing our theme that we've seen throughout these videos, and then take a look at something completely different, an industrial strength logic called ACL2. And I'm going to go relatively quickly through the propositional part of this because we're fairly comfortable with that already and we've seen it quite a bit in the previous videos. So what we're going to do is set up a little scenario. Think about a mobile phone. And what we're going to do is say, well, let's try and design the logic which decides whether a phone should be unlocked or not. So we're going to pretend this, this mobile phone has three sensors. The first sensor checks whether the phone is out of someone's pocket. Maybe it uses some clever machine learning and accelerometers and location data to do this. We don't care about that. All we're going to do is say, this is called P. This is the symbol P in propositional logic. It can be either true or false. Additionally, the user can enter their passcode into their phone. And if they get it right, then we're going to call the symbol C true. And if they don't, it will be zero. We're playing a bit fast and loose here with the syntax of propositional logic. I've spent a, quite a long time emphasizing that the only symbols in propositional logic are P, Q, and R. We're now introducing this symbol C, and that's purely for convenience. We can more easily associate the symbol C with the word code. And finally, the user can also use their fingerprint to get into their phone. And we're going to call this the symbol F. So what's the propositional sentence which tells us whether the phone ought to be unlocked or not? Well, first of all, the phone has to be out of the user's pocket. And they also have to enter their passcode correctly. So we have the sentence P and C. There's also the possibility that, again, the phone is out of the user's pocket, but instead they use their fingerprint. So now we add on OR, P and F. And immediately you may well be able to see where this is going because this can be simplified. And maybe we're going to be manufacturing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these circuits, and we want to reduce the number of logic gates that we use. So here we're using three, we're using two ands and an or. We can reduce this to using two logic gates, an and and an or. So here we have the phone is out of the pocket, and also either they enter their passcode correctly or they use their fingerprint correctly. And sure, this is a bit of a contrived example. In reality, you wouldn't do this kind of micro-optimization, or it would be done for you by a compiler. This is purely for a nice intuitive example. The real question is, how do we know that these two expressions are the same? Yes, you can eyeball them and say they're the same, but we want to prove that. And the important thing here is, of course, for much more complex circuits, you won't be able to eyeball them and tell intuitively as a human. So we'll want some assurance that circuits are the same. And so we introduce a new symbol called by implication. So in propositional logic, we saw our implication symbol, which is read if A, then B. With by implication, we read this A, if and only if B. And its meaning is actually really simple. So if we have A, if and only if B, all that's saying is that the, the forward direction of the implication holds, A implies B, but also the reverse direction holds as well. So B implies A. 
And in order to prove by implication, all we need to show is that this way, this direction holds, and the reverse direction holds. I'm only going to show the forward direction for speed, but the proof for the reverse direction is also similar. So let's go ahead and try and prove this first expression implies this second expression. We start off as we normally do with a implication. So all we're saying here is that we have an syntactic entailment and the left hand side implies the right hand side. These are the two expressions we saw before. What can we do here? Well, there's only one thing we can do really, and that's use the implication introduction rule. So from whatever we have up here, the rest of this proof tree, we're going to introduce this top level implication symbol. And working in reverse, working upwards, all we do there is take the left hand side of this implication and assume it's true and bring it over into our assumptions. So now we have our entailment symbol, our turnstile, with the assumptions on the left hand side and what we're trying to prove under those assumptions on the right. We repeat the process, so again the top level operator here is an AND. What do we do? We split that apart using the AND introduction rule. And we're going to do that as well using a bit of a simplification, again playing fast and loose with the syntax. We're going to say this is abbreviated to the symbol gamma. Because otherwise if we were to try to write this out in all the branches of our proof tree it would just get unwieldy. So using the AND introduction rule, under these assumptions we need to show P and separately we need to show that C and F hold. And it's here where we need a little bit more human imagination, some intuition, because we don't have a rule which can deal with this symbol P on its own. We need to think about what we can do with our assumptions to show that P holds. And we look at our assumptions and think, well, the top level operator is an OR. So we have this disjunction, as it's called, expressions separated by an OR symbol. And we want to be able to split this apart. And this is where our OR elimination rule comes in. Because if we assume this is true, if we use our assumption rule to bring this over into our entailment, then it's quite possible that under this assumption only and this half only that P holds and we can show what we want to. So let's go ahead and do that. We bring the assumption in gamma over into our proof tree under the assumption that the left hand disjunct holds. So under the assumption that P and C holds, we want to show P and separately under the assumption that only P and F holds, we want to show P. This first tree is dead simple. All we've done is used the assumption axiom. We've just brought an assumption from gamma into our proof tree. What do we do to show P? Well, it, at first it seems like we're in a kind of similar position to where we were here. Fortunately, we've got an extra assumption now. We've got this assumption that P and C holds. And pretty much immediately from that assumption, if we have P and C now in our proof tree, we can use the AND elimination rule to say, well, if P and C holds, then P obviously holds on its own as well. So we can step down from this step to this branch and to show P and C holds under the assumption that P and C holds, well, again, we use the assumption rule. This branch is almost identical to the P branch, but this time we're using the assumptions in gamma, the assumption here, uh, to show that um, P holds, uh, sorry, no, we're not, we're showing that the under the assumption that only this right hand disjunct holds, 
to show that P holds. I'm not going to show that because it's almost identical to this. And what we're doing in this branch, again, is using the assumption gamma to show that C and F holds. And intuitively, as humans, we can see this because C holds in this disjunct and F holds here. So I've gone through this example fairly quickly because I think it's more interesting if we press on to have a look at ACL2 and what this can do for us. ACL2 is in a group of programs known as interactive theorem provers. And there's a few of these knocking around, so ACL2, Isabel, Hall 4, and a few others. And what these programs do is they help us prove theorems. The interactive part of that, in interactive theorem provers, is more of a polite way of saying that actually there always has to be some human intuition in theorem proving. The computer can't do it all for us. So let's hop over to a terminal window and have a look at ACL2. The name ACL2 is actually an acronym and it stands for a computational logic for applicative common lisp. Okay, so that's not quite an acronym. There are actually two lots of the sub acronym ACL. But if we break this down, it gives us an idea about what ACL2 does. So firstly, ACL, a computational logic. What do we mean by this? All we're saying is that ACL2 is a logic, just like we've looked at in the previous videos, and it is a logic which helps us to reason about computation. So it helps us model things like lists, or memory, or discrete time intervals, or conditionals. And we can compare this to something like calculus, for example, which helps us to reason about modelling continuous functions and continuous time. The second ACL stands for an applicative common lisp. And what we are saying here is that ACL2 simply models the programming language lisp. In reality, it doesn't model all of lisp, simply a subset of it which is amenable to reasoning. And don't worry if you've not come across Lisp before, we're going to take a whirlwind tour over the next few minutes to get the necessary syntax that we need to understand Lisp programs. So the syntax of ACL2 is Lisp, and this makes for one interesting property, which is that yes, we can reason rigorously about programs we write in Lisp, but it also means that by the end, we have an executable artifact, which we can run. Going back to the framework, which we've seen over the last few videos, the semantics of ACL2 model the effects of Lisp forms, as they're called, programs that we write in Lisp. And the deductive system is a complex one, but one key feature is that it is extensible. This means that theorems we prove about Lisp programs, we can then use to reason about more complex Lisp programs. And we'll see this later on. So before we dive into ACL2 proper, it'll be really useful to get a very brief understanding of how Lisp works and how to read basic Lisp expressions. So the key thing to understand about Lisp is that everything is based around the list data structure. And we're fairly familiar with how to write lists from well-known programming languages. The syntax is only slightly different. So a Lisp list is delimited by normal brackets, and we write the items out with spaces in between. In most programming languages, lists are used predominantly for storing data. In Lisp, however, lists are at the heart of computation itself. Specifically, function application is represented as a list. So let's see a, a concrete example of this. Let's say we want to add the two numbers 2 and 8 
The function for adding is, perhaps unsurprisingly, the plus symbol. And the arguments to that function are the numbers 2 and 8. And notice here that unlike in most programming languages, where we would put the plus symbol between the two operands, called infix, here we always have prefix notation. The function symbol always comes first, then the arguments to the function, and they are all contained in a list. So if we press enter to evaluate this, we get the answer 10. And we can do more complex things with this, so we can nest function applications. Simple example, if we want to multiply 3 by what we just evaluated, 2 plus 10, we would enter the multiply symbol, multiply 3, and then have a nested function application of adding 2 and 8. So 2 and 8 is 10, times by 3 should give us 30. And there we go. As an aside, those of you who have done some Lisp already may well realise that plus isn't actually a function, it's a thing called a macro. Uh, but the distinction isn't too important for the examples we're going to see in this video. As our first example of something ACL2 can do for us, let's take a look at the first example we saw in this video. So the mock circuitry to decide whether a phone should be unlocked. And what we're going to do is ask ACL2 to try to prove this theorem for us. So we're going to start out with uh, an ACL2 function theorem. And all this is doing is saying, is asking ACL2 to attempt to prove the following theorem. And what theorem do we want to prove? Well, this is where the Lisp syntax starts getting slightly awkward to read, if you're not used to it, because the top level function symbol has to come first. Now, if you remember back to our original example, the top level function was a by implication, implication both ways. So we're going to say, well, the top level is an if, if and only if. Out of interest, this way of writing if with the double F is very common in mathematical notation for representing by implication. So on the left hand side of the implication, we had the expression P and C or P and F. So or is the top level function here and its expressions are and PC and and P. F. And on the other side, we have the expression P and C or F, which writing in prefix notation, we represent like this. Closing off a few brackets. Now, when you press enter, ACL2 is going to try to prove this for us. And propositional logic, our running example through these videos, is built into ACL2. And in fact, ACL2 can deal deterministically with propositional logic. So if we press enter on this, we get a nice QED. The theorem has been proved and it prints some information about how it did it. But it turns out that it was a fairly simple proof for ACL2 to evaluate. Of course, ACL2 doesn't just have to prove theorems for us. We can also evaluate this proposition under an interpretation. So let's set some variables. Let's say that the symbol P is true. The symbol C is false. We represent falsehood in Lisp slash ACL2 as nil. And the symbol F is also false. And then we're simply going to type in the expression we've just seen. So if or and pc and pf. So that's the left hand side of the implication p and c or p and f. And on the left hand side of the implication we have and p or cf. 
And again, let's close off some brackets and press enter. And thankfully, we have T. And in fact, we could have expected that we have true because this theorem is valid. What we did above was to prove the theorem. So we know that this proposition evaluates to true under any interpretation. If we were to just evaluate one side of the by implication, then we won't necessarily get true. So let's use the same bindings as before. We'll say let p equal true, c equal false, and f equal false. And this time we'll just use the left hand side of the implication. So we take the or of the conjunction of p and c, a little bit like when we have terms separated by an or and we call that a disjunction. When we have terms separated by an and, we call that a conjunction. So or of p and c and p and f. Let's press enter to evaluate this. And we find that the left hand side of our implication is false. But this is fine because the left hand side of any implication being false means that the implication as a whole is true. In the example we've just seen, the proof went through automatically when we asked ACL2 to try and prove the proposition. But in actual fact, this will rarely be the case when we're dealing with more complex proofs. So the example I'm about to show you is actually taken from the ACL2 introductory exercises. And it demonstrates how the user can guide the theorem prover towards a proof by extending the deductive system. So fair warning, if you think you might want to learn ACL2 properly, feel free to skip this bit because it is an exercise in their tutorial. And this example is exactly that. It's an example. I'm not trying to teach you how to use ACL2 here. I'm simply highlighting some of the key points. So what we're going to try and do is prove the following theorem. And it's fairly easy to state. We're going to try and show that x is a subset of x. So here x can represent anything, but really it's intended to represent lists, as we've seen already. And this is quite an intuitive example, because if you've got any mathematical background, you'll know that if you have a set x, then it is also a subset of itself. So let's press enter and try to evaluate this theorem. Let's try and prove this theorem. ACL2 spits out a lot of stuff at us. And if we scroll back up the buffer here, we'll see it's made some effort to try and prove our theorem. But ultimately, we don't need to read any of that in detail because we see that the theorem ended, the theorem proof attempt ended in failure. Fortunately, ACL2 is relatively clever and it gives us some key checkpoints that it thinks might be useful for us to examine further. The first checkpoint is really just reiterating the goal or a very minor variation of it, our original theorem. It's the second checkpoint that we're presented with, which is the important one for us. So what's this checkpoint saying? It's saying that ACL2 tried to prove this checkpoint at some point in the proof, but that it failed. It didn't know how to. What's this checkpoint say? Well, it's saying that if x is a non-empty list, in this case, and that the tail of x is a subset of the tail of x, here we see some lisp notation. The kudra, CDR, of x really means the tail of x if x is a list. So if x is a non-empty list and the tail of x is a subset of the tail of x, then the tail of x is a subset of x itself. This is fairly intuitive because if we add an element onto the front of the tail of x to form x, then the tail of x is still going to be a subset of x itself. So we can see as humans that this proof ought to go through, 
but for some reason ACL2 has failed. And this is where some human creativity needs to come in, because what we need to do is generalise this statement slightly. So instead of talking about solely X, we really want to talk about two lists, let's say A and B. So we're going to ask ACL2 to prove a similar but subtly different theorem to this checkpoint it's just shown us. So we're going to start off by saying DEF theorem. This is slightly different to the theorem keyword we saw before in that once we prove it, it will allow ACL2 to use that proof in further proofs. We're going to give this a name, so we're going to call it subset P Kudra. And what's the theorem going to be? Well, we want an implication similar to the checkpoint, and we're saying if A is a subset of the tail of B, the Kudra of B, then A is a subset of B. Let's press enter and see what ACL2 gives us. It's printed out a huge amount of stuff once again, but the important letters we're looking for here are the QED. ACL2 has succeeded in proving this for us. Now let's try proving the original proposition again. So is x a subset of itself? Let's press enter. And this time ACL2 has managed to prove this. And it's done that by using the proof that we just submitted. In reality, for this kind of proposition, x being a subset of x, reflexivity, we would probably use a DEF theorem like we did in the lemma we just proved. So let's do that. Subset reflexive, subset p. The p at the end of this subset indicates that this is a predicate and it will return a true or false value x is a subset of x, and now we would be able to use that proposition in future proofs. The examples we've just had a look at were exactly that, examples. ACL2 has, however, seen use in industry, often for verifying that complex hardware designs implement the correct functionality. For instance, one example is that bugs were found in an AMD implementation of some floating point circuitry, bugs which were not discovered by testing. ACL2 has also been used for some other big names, ARM, IBM, Intel, Oracle, Centaur Technology, Rockwell Collins, and some details of these examples can be found on their website. So as a conclusion to this series, we've looked at the three constituent parts of logics. Logic comprises, and you're probably tired of hearing this by now, a syntax, which tells us what we can write down and how we can represent it in a computer. A semantics, which links the syntax to the real world, it provides meaning to the symbols and models things in real life. And finally, the deductive system, which allows us to reason rigorously about the semantics using the syntax. We've also seen two key properties of logics, one of which we really, really want every logic to hold, and that's soundness. So if we can derive syntactic entailment using the deductive system, then we will also have semantic entailment. And the other property which we would like logics to have, but may not always be possible, is completeness. That's a property that if we have semantic entailment, any semantic entailment will be derivable using the deductive system. Throughout the series, we've taken a look in a fair bit of depth at propositional logic. And in this video, also taken a look at an industrial logic, ACL2. So I hope you found these videos useful in giving you some background and terminology and a framework with which to approach new logics.
Thank you for watching. Goodbye.